The purpose of this video is to explain the new equations for chapter 10, the t-test for two independent samples. And to do so, I'm going to compare the new equations to the equations we saw in chapter 9, which was a single sample t-test. So we'll notice up here, um, the first column represents the notation that we see when we're conducting a single sample t-test. Essentially, what we're doing when we are conducting a single sample t-test is we are comparing a sample mean to a population mean. Um, essentially, we're comparing m to mu and determining uh, if there is a statistical difference, um, a statistically significant difference um, between those two values. Uh, and we've learned that um, our estimated standard error from the previous chapter, again, represents, um, essentially is it representing the estimated average or expected difference between m and mu. So it tells us on average what we would expect um, that difference to equal if we're comparing the sample average to population average. Again, our choices when we see a difference are to determine is that difference due to sampling error or is it due to statistical significance due to a treatment or differences in populations, for example, males versus females, a quasi-independent variable. So we understand what um, estimated standard error represents. Again, estimated average difference between sample mean and population mean. And visually, what we can we can understand is that in the center again, if we're talking about a treated population, so the untreated population mean would be in the center, and then we would take a sample, let's say sample one, and then sample two, sample three, sample four, sample five. And again, theoretically, if we had access to all possible population samples, we'd, we'd be able to um, create a distribution of sample means with those values. And we would note that there are differences. You know, these are not all in the same location. And so each value deviates from the population mean a certain amount. And therefore, the estimated standard error represents the average of those differences. Um, again, we would have the center value representing the population mean, for instance, the untreated population mean. We take the sample, expose them to treatment, and then we would determine the difference between those. And theoretically speaking, we would be able to calculate on average what we would expect those differences to equal if the null were true. Again, the null is stating, the null states that m, right, m, is equal to mu. Now this notation you won't see, but what we're saying is the untreated population will equal the mu for the treated. And recognizing that we use the sample mean as a representation of the treated population, um, but the null is referencing the comparison between the two populations, the treated population versus the untreated population. And the null would state that they would be equal. We would see no difference in be, uh, between those two. Okay, so now that we've established what we did, um, I reviewed what we did in Chapter 9, again, the comparison of the sample mean to population mean, what we're moving into in this chapter is um, the independent measures t-test, which we are now comparing the mean difference, so um, the difference between sample 1 average minus sample 2 average and the population average 1 minus population average two.
So we are taking two samples that are representations of two specific populations. And we're going to compare those two and see if there's a difference. Um, and when we're plotting this new distribution, in the center of the distribution is the, the null hypothesis, which would say that mu1 minus mu2 is equal to zero, that they're not different from each other, that population one is equal to population two. So if there's zero difference, that means that they're equal to one another. And we're going to take our two samples, again, representations of the populations, and then compare those differences. So in this case, our estimated standard error, similar concept, it's an average difference, but instead of it being the average difference between m and mu, um, the estimated standard error represents the average, average or expected difference between m1 minus m2 and mu1 minus mu2. So if we take our sample, so the population, again, the two populations are equivalent to one another. So if we take one minus the other, it would equal zero. And then we take our two samples, let's say we administer treatment to one, and then the other one we don't administer treatment to. Again, um, we rarely have access to population. So this idea uh, that's presented in Chapter 9, which says we can compare a sample to a population, requires that we have population parameters. In most cases, we don't have access to population parameters. So now what we're doing here is comparing sample to sample, and both samples are representations of populations. And so if we take the difference, um, then we can see, again, we're testing to determine if that difference is due to, to one group receiving treatment and the other one not, or if both are, are being exposed to two different treat, treatments. For instance, um, one group gets the antidepressant drug at 50 milligrams, and the other one gets an antidepressant drug at um, 100 milligrams, whatever it may be. But somehow those groups are different and we're using samples as representations of the populations. And so again, theoretically, if we were to have access to all um, samples, let's say sample three minus sample four, and then sample five minus sample six, again, this is all theoretically having access to all possible samples um, that would enable us to construct a distribution of sample means. And when we take those differences, then we'd compare them to the center difference, which is zero. The null says that there's no difference between the two. So again, the concept being the same that this value of zero, if this is a regular number line, then whatever this value is different from zero, and then from here to here is different from zero, and from here to here is different from zero, and from here to here is different from zero, and therefore the estimated standard error is the average of those differences. Um, the differences that we see between the sample means in relation to the center difference, which represents the null, and is a representation of the two population mean differences. So this is just a basic um, um, presentation of what we're looking at, what the variables represent, and again, introducing these new equations based on what we learned in the previous chapter. Okay, so again, back to chapter nine, um, what we are comparing our sample mean to is the population mean. And now we're talking about the difference between two samples in comparison to the difference between two populations. And we just talked about the um, definition of estimated standard error for both scenarios. And notice for our new equation, so we have um, estimated standard error. And this chapter is equal to the square root of this funny looking thing here. And that's called the pooled variance. Um, and then n sub 1. The sub 1 is simply telling us the sample size um, of our first sample. And then we have this new character 
called pooled variance. Again, the P stand, uh, stands for pooled, and we already know what S squared re represents its variance, and then over N sub 2. So again, we'll have two samples, sample 1, right, and then sample 2, each with their own uh, independent sample sizes, and so that will all play into this particular equation. In order to calculate pooled variance, again, you can think of this equation as the average of these variances. Um, the pooled variance, again, we're pooling the variance of the two. Um, we were given two equations, so, so the notation is S P squared or S squared with um, subnotation P to represent the pooled variance. And we're taking SS, the sum of squared deviations of our first distribution, added to the sum of squared deviations for our second distribution, over degrees of freedom for our first distribution, added to degrees of freedom for our second distribution. So again, if, if N1 was equal to 10, 10 individuals in our first sample, and N2 is equal to 10, Right, so degrees of freedom, just as we learned in the previous chapter, is n minus 1. In this case, it would equal 10 minus 1, and that would be 9. Similarly, similarly for the second one, second distribution, we have n minus 1, 10 minus 1, and we would get 9. So both degrees of freedom would equal 9. So you'll need to know what degrees of freedom um, is equal to for each independent sample, and we're going to use them in combination to calculate the pooled variance. So again, that's one equation, and um, most likely you'll be given the sum of squared deviations unless you're given all your x values, and we've learned from Chapter 4 how to calculate SS. So those will be the two um, situations where you'll have to utilize SS to calculate pooled variance. Again, you'll be given SS, or you'll have to calculate it given your x values. Now another, I have over here, this other alternative equation, this one here, and um, that one states that pooled variance, pooled variance, so just a different um, manner in which we can calculate pooled variance, it's de degrees of freedom for our first distribution multiplied by the variance of our first distribution added to the degrees of freedom for our second distribution multiplied by the variance of our second distribution. So it looks a lot more complex than it really is. If we just break it down, we'll know what n is and therefore we can figure out degrees of freedom quite simply and variance um, most likely will be given to you, which is why you would use this equation opposed to this one. Um, so we would have deg over degrees of freedom for our first distribution added to degrees of freedom for our second distribution. And just again, to simplify this, it looks more complex than it really is. If we break it down and, and think about how we calculate um, variance, then this equation should make a lot of sense. Our variance is equal to SS over N minus 1, or that's the same as saying SS over degrees of freedom. Okay, so if we think about that for a second, so variance is equal to SS over degrees of freedom. If I wanted to solve for SS, and I'm going to move over here to give myself a little more room, SS would then be equal to degrees of freedom multiplied by our variance. Okay, so that's what we're seeing here in this equation. So SS is the equivalent of degrees of freedom multiplied by um, variance. And we would just do that for each sample. So that's the same here in the numerator of this equation. So opposed to having SS, right, you may be given variance. And therefore, this would be the equation this would be the equation to use if you're given variance opposed to sum of squared deviations. One other comparison I'd like to make is in chapter 9, again, our standard error, or estimated, I should say, our estimated, whoops, estimated standard error, 
for the previous chapter was S sub M, and that was equal to variance over N. Again, we did learn a different equation, but this one um, will help draw equivalency between the new equations and um, the previous equations from chapter 9. So in this chapter, the estimated standard error is now notated S, and then in parentheses, M1 minus M2. Again, we're talking about the average difference between the sample means in comparison to the population mean. And it's equal to, as i written um, previously, the pulled variance over N1 plus the pulled variance over N2. Essentially, you can think of it as we're doubling this, right? Because we have two samples. So in the previous um, process, it was a single sample t-test. We only had one sample to work with. Now in the independent measures t-test, we're working with two samples. And they're independent of each other, meaning that we have two different groups of individuals. Um, and we'll talk about between research design, between subject research design and within subject research design. This is between, and I might as well just um, show you that, between subject design means that there are different participants in each sample versus within, within subject design, same participants across conditions. So when we have conditions, we have different um, levels of the independent variable. And so between subject design means there are two completely different sets of individuals in each sample. Within subject design means that we use the same individuals in every condition of the research. For instance, if you're doing a before and after, you would have to have the same individuals in the before data collection process as you would in the after. So you would measure them over time, how they reacted to some kind of treatment. So when we're talking about an independent measures t-test, we are referring to using a between subject design where there are different individuals. So again, that brings us to the process of having had to pool their variances because they're going to have their own sample variances and then using those values to calculate the estimated standard error because we have two separate independent samples we can think of it as simply doubling what we did in chapter 9. We have now two samples that we're working with. Each sample has its own respective statistics, its mean, variance, degrees of freedom, and all of those things need to be um, combined so that we can talk about one statistic that represents the difference between these two samples. Okay, so drawing some more. Um, comparisons to what we did in chapter 9. The t-statistic um, by definition was the comparison of a sample to the population. So we're taking, so it was t is equal to m minus mu over our estimated standard error. Now in this chapter, again, because we have two samples, um, we're talking about the difference between those two samples in comparison to the population difference. Again, don't um, forget that this, right, mu1 minus mu2 comes from the null and o is always equal to zero. It means that in the center, we expect those two populations to be equivalent, equal to one another. So if we take one subtract the other, the difference would equal zero. But notice again the similarities between the equations. It's talking about the sample statistics, in this case, the mean difference of those samples, and then minus the population parameters, which in this case come from the null hypothesis. They, it always states that they're equal to zero. 
and then divided by the estimated standard error. So we see that it's identical to what we did in the, in the previous um, chapter, the independent, or excuse me, single sample t-test. Again, just to restate um, the null, the null says there's no difference between these populations. So we would see that population one is equal to population two. Or we may see it written like this. If we were to take population one and subtract population two, that would equal zero. The research hypothesis would state that population one is not equal to population two. Or if we were to take population one average and subtract population two, it would not equal zero. It would be some difference. If, um, and please note that this uh, notation references the process of a two-tailed test. Again, we're not specifying the direction of that um, hypothesis. We're just expecting some difference to occur. Now, if we were um, to apply one-tailed test, this is an example of what it may look like in terms of the notation. So the null would state, let's say, for instance, the um, mu1 is less than or equal to mu2. And that could be restated as saying, if we were to take population 1 average and subtract population 2 average, that difference would be less than or equal to 0. If I take my first value and subtract my second value, and if I expect something um, to be not equal, right, um, excuse me, if I expect it to be equal, those differences would equal zero. Um, but if I think that my first population is smaller, the average is smaller than my second population, then the difference would be something less than zero. The, the research hypothesis would look like this. We would say that the po population one is greater than population two, or if we were to take population one and subtract population two, again, averages, um, we would expect that difference to be greater than zero. So um, this is an example of a one-tailed hypothesis because we're specifying the direction. And then finally, um, after we calculate our t-statistic, we'll need to find our critical t. The way that we enter the t table is the same as we did in chapter 9, but the one difference here is now degrees of freedom. Again, think of the, the uh, instance of doubling everything. We're going to take degrees of freedom for our first distribution and add it to the degrees of freedom for our second distribution, as you see here. Or you can think of it as um, taking degrees of freedom is the same as n1 minus 1, right, for our first sample and added to n2 plus, excuse me, minus, minus 1. So let's think of if we had um, n1 was equal to 10 and n2 was equal to 10. Degrees of freedom for 1 would be 9. Degrees of freedom for 2 would be 9. And so combine, again, we have to take into consideration we're working with two samples. We need to account for the statistics coming from both samples. So in this case, oops, and I just saw a little mistake here. I forgot to put my one here. Sorry about that. Minus one. So then we would have in nine plus nine, and that would equal 18. And that's the degrees of freedom value that we would use to enter um, the t distribution along with are we conducting a two-tailed test, one-tailed test, and alpha. We'll still need that information which will be given to us in our examples. But now this is the new way we calculate degrees of freedom. And the reason it, it looks different from the previous chapter is due to the fact that we're working with two independent sample means um, coming from different samples made up of different participants in the different conditions of the independent variable.
Finally, we have um, our new equations for estimated D, R squared, and our confidence interval. So uh, in our previous chapter, D was equal to, estimated D was equal to M minus mu over the standard deviation of the sample. And notice here, again, it's the comparison of two sample means divided by the square root of the pooled variance. If we take the square root of variance, that's the standard deviation. So again, hopefully you see the equivalency, or the, um, how these e equations are similar um, in terms of the concepts that we are using to calculate this statistic um, referred to as Cohen's D. So again, Cohen's D represents the mean difference, in this case m1 minus m2, um, re represents the mean difference expressed in or reported in standard deviation units. And as we learned back in chapter 8, um, this calculation omits the influence of sample size. because we've learned that the relationship between n and t, the t statistic is significant. As n increases, our standard error decreases and our t statistic increases. So in a way to um, it, it omit or delete the effects of sample size in determining the effect um, or the difference between these two means, we calculate Cohen's d. R squared, the equation is identical to the previous chapter, and again, we learned that what this represents is the percent percentage of variance, variance or change accounted for by the treatment. So any difference that we see between sample 1 mean and sample 2 mean, um, this statistic will give it, express it as a percentage and um, we can then say that that percentage is due to treatment. So for example, if R squared was equal to 0.6, we would say 60% of the change that we measure between these two groups um, is due to treatment. Now, in most cases, we're, we're talking about administering a treatment, an independent um, independent variable that can be manipulated, but we can also be talking about the difference between populations, males and females. So if we calculated R squared, as in this case 0.6, we could say 60% of the difference in um, depression, the amount of depression between males and females, is as a result of a difference in gender. So again, noting that there's no treatment being administered, we're just comparing levels of depression between two populations. Um, which rep represent a quasi-independent variable. To, um, these two groups are being defined by this variable, but it isn't a true independent variable because I can't randomly assign individuals to be females or males. You're either female or you're male. Um, so when, um, just a point of clarification or um, a moment of warning that when you are expressing this, just recognize that the, the standard broad way of ex explaining it is to say due to treatment, but it could be due to differences in populations. A perfect example to latch on to is the difference in gender when you're comparing males to females. And then finally, um, our confidence interval, just like we learned in the previous chapter, 
Um, that's a calculated range of the hypothesized population mean difference. So we're going to calculate a range. So we're going to use the sample mean difference, so m1 minus m2, and we're going to calculate a, a range of mu1 minus mu2 and all the way to another value above that sample statistic and mu1 minus mu2. Again, our confidence interval is going to calculate this range that we anticipate the true population mean difference to reside. In other words, if we administer the treatment and then we measure the difference between these samples, those samples are always representations of the population. The sample data, right, serves as the default or a good um, indication of what the population parameters would look like. And now we're going to calculate within a certain amount of confidence what that true difference is equal to. And this is our new equation. And notice it's very similar to our um, previous chapter equation. In the previous chapter, we said we were calculating mu was equal to our sample plus or minus our t value multiplied by our estimated standard error. So the difference being that instead of just m, we're talking about the difference between the two samples. Um, and then instead of estimated standard error of um, the mean in comparison to the population value, it's the difference between those two sample means again.